Okay, <clears throat> this is um, the podcast for Chapter 12, dealing with the uh, autonomic nervous system, which is the division of the nervous system that controls our, um, our homeostatic and, and visceral function. Okay, so it deals with our internal organs, and the targets are everything except skeletal muscle. We'll talk about the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system, talk about what it does, talk about the anatomical structures that contribute to it, and then we'll talk about some of the pharmacology that deals with it. We'll define autonomic tone. We'll talk about different types of autonomic fibers and talk about the terms used to describe autonomic um, receptors. Okay, So, the autonomic nervous system is designed to control homeostasis and it works on an unconscious level so that we don't have to spend all our waking hours controlling our internal function. Okay, um, Examples include control of blood pressure, control of heart rate, control of glandular secretions, um, control of the movement of food through the digestive system, and control of the uh, the routing of air in the lungs, okay, just to name a few functions. Um, the, um, the two subdivisions of the autonomic nervous system are the sympathetic and the parasympathetic division. And the sympathetic division is designed to prepare the body to deal with a threat situation, whereas the parasympathetic division is designed to prepare the body for everyday maintenance. Okay. In a visceral reflex pathway, um, we see some of the same components as we see in a normal reflex pathway. We see activation of a receptor, transmission of sensory information to the CNS that gets processed primarily by the, uh, the brain stem and the hypothalamus. And then we have motor uh, commands that are sent to effector organs, and then the target does its thing. An example is regulation of blood pressure through the baroreceptor reflex. A sudden decrease in blood pressure activates baroreceptors in the aortic and carotid bodies. Sensory nerves carry the impulse to the medulla oblongata, which is part of the brain stem that determines that the blood pressure is too low and it sends motor signals to the heart to speed up the heart rate and to the uh, smooth muscle in the blood vessels in order to um, increase vasoconstriction and that all promotes an increase in overall blood pressure. Divisions of the autonomic nervous system include the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Um, the sympathetic is designed for uh, emergency situations, and the parasympathetic is designed for um, fuel storage and waste elimination. Okay, so we give them the nicknames fight or flight and rest and digest. Okay, so some examples of um, sympathetic effects would be an increase in heart rate, blood pressure, blood glucose, um, an increase in um, blood oxygen level and blood pressure, okay, uh, an increase in sweat production, and a reduction in the production of urine, and a reduction in the, uh, in the activity of the digestive system, okay, just to name a few. And all of that is designed to get oxygen and nutrients to skeletal muscle more quickly. Um, other effects include um, dilation of blood vessels that feed skeletal muscle, heart and lungs, and constriction of blood vessels that feed the urinary, reproductive, and digestive system. And then the parasympathetic division uh, primarily has the, uh, the opposite effect, okay? The, um, the nerves that bring that information to those targets are different in the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. In the uh, sympathetic division, the, uh, the nerve leads come from the thoracic and lumbar spine, whereas in the parasympathetic division, they come from the brain stem and the sacral spine. And um, 
they are two neuron chains. There's a pre- and a post-ganglionic neuron. Um, in the parasympathetic division, the pre-ganglionic neurons are quite long, and the post-ganglionics are rather short, whereas in the sympathetic division, the uh, pre-ganglionics are short and the post-ganglionics are long. And then there's also a difference in the types of neurotransmitters that are used by the pre- and the post-ganglionics um, in both of these divisions, okay, as well as a difference in the effects. So let's take a look at sympathetic and parasympathetic responses. In this video, I want to introduce the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic nervous system, which is part of the overall nervous system. And this is a functional division of the nervous system, not a structural division like the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The autonomic nervous system consists of efferent neurons in the peripheral nervous system that do specific jobs. So these are efferent neurons. And these neurons control three different types of cells. The first are smooth muscle cells, which are in all sorts of structures all over our body, like around our blood vessels. And they control cardiac muscle, the muscle that makes up our heart tissue. So cardiac muscle. And these muscle tissue types are different than the skeletal muscle, the muscle that's all over attached to our skeleton that moves us around, because those are controlled by different efferent neurons of the peripheral nervous system. Those are controlled by lower motor neurons, not autonomic neurons. The last thing that autonomic neurons control are gland cells. Some gland cells are controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Now the autonomic nervous system is called this because it tends to control all these things without conscious involvement. It doesn't require the involvement of consciousness to control these things. So it's kind of autonomous. It kind of does this stuff on its own without our conscious cells having to be involved for the most part. And we divide the autonomic nervous system into two big subsystems. So let me write two big arrows here. And this part we call the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system, which is the first big part of the autonomic nervous system. So I'll just write S and S for short for sympathetic nervous system. And this other big part we call the parasympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic. So I'll just write PNS for short for parasympathetic nervous system. And there are a number of big differences between these two parts of the autonomic nervous system that we can talk about in this kind of introductory talk. The first big difference is kind of where they start in the central nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system starts in the middle of the spinal cord, kind of the middle part of the spinal cord. Let me draw a bunch of somas here. And I'll just take one of these here and I'll draw a little short axon on the first neuron that's coming out of the central nervous system. And then it's going to synapse with a second neuron in a ganglion close to where the first neuron is, and then the second neuron is going to send the longer axon to reach its target cell. So let me just draw a big T to represent some kind of target cell that it's going to synapse on, and this target cell will be a smooth muscle cell, a cardiac muscle cell, or a gland cell. And here's an illustration of kind of the entire autonomic nervous system. And here they're showing kind of the middle part of the spinal cord that all these first neurons in the sympathetic nervous system are starting. And then there's a short axon until they synapse in a ganglia that's pretty close to the spine. Here's a set of ganglia, and here are a few other ganglia, but they all tend to be pretty close to the spine. This set of ganglia are actually often linked together in kind of a chain, which we actually call the sympathetic chain. And here's a, just a different illustration of the same thing. So here it's showing in the middle part of the spinal cord that first axon's coming out, synapsing in a ganglia close to the spine, with a lot of these ganglia linked together in a chain, and then the second neuron sending a longer axon out to synapse on the target cell in whatever tissue you're talking about that contains smooth muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells, or gland cells. Now the parasympathetic nervous system has its first neurons start in a different place in the central nervous system. They start either up here in the brainstem, or they start way down here at the bottom of the spinal cord. And then their first neuron tends to send a long axon out to synapse with the second neuron in a ganglion, 
at a distance from the first neuron. And then that second neuron usually sends out a short axon to synapse on its target cell. I'll just write a big T here for target cell. And here this illustration is showing this as well, where it's showing the first neurons of the parasympathetic nervous system either up here in the brainstem or down here at the bottom of the spinal cord. And then it's showing these long axons on the first neuron until it reaches a ganglia at a distance from the first neuron soma, and then a shorter axon on that second neuron until it reaches its target cell. And here's another illustration just showing the same thing. So here's these first axons coming out of either the brain stem up high or the bottom part of the spinal cord down low. And then these first long axons go all the way till they meet a ganglion at a distance from the first neuron soma. And then the second neuron sends a shorter axon to the target cells. So the similarities in the structure of the different parts of the autonomic nervous system are that they both usually consist of a chain of two neurons connecting the central nervous system to the target cell. But the differences are where those first neurons start and whether there's a short first axon and a long second axon or a long first axon and a short second axon. But more importantly than these structural differences between the different parts of the autonomic nervous system are the functional differences. And these neurons do so many different things and so many tissues of the body that it's a little hard to talk about them in general. But there are these great phrases that can, can kind of help think through lots of the changes that these different parts of the autonomic nervous system do. And for the sympathetic nervous system, the phrase is fight or flight. Fight or flight. That the sympathetic nervous system, when it's activated, will cause lots of changes in the body that'll prepare to either fight or run away which can kind of help you deal with threatening or dangerous situations. So I'll, I'll write that in red here for the sympathetic nervous system, whereas the parasympathetic nervous system, I'll write in a nice cool green here because it, its phrase is rest and digest. Rest and digest. So it, when it's active, it often causes lots of changes in the body that are more important for homeostasis and just maintenance of the body in non-threatening situations. So let's take a few examples of a few tissues where these different responses happen to get a feel for what this means. So first let's look down here at the gastrointestinal system, the intestines or the gut. And both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system play a role in a lot of activities of the gastrointestinal system. But one is blood flow to the intestines because the amount of blood flowing through the intestines plays a big role in how much digestion the intestines can do blood flow to intestines. And it also plays a big role in how much blood is available for other parts of the body. So when the sympathetic nervous system is activated in some kind of fight or flight situation, blood flow to the intestines decreases. And that blood is actually diverted away from the intestines, often to skeletal muscle. So all our muscles all over our body that can help us move to deal with dangerous situations, the blood is going to leave the intestines and go to that. Because during a dangerous situation is not the time to be digesting food, it's the time to be moving. So the blood's flow decreases to the intestines and is diverted to skeletal muscle. Whereas most of the time, when you're in a non-threatening situation and, and it's time to rest and digest, the peripheral nervous system is activated and that increases blood flow to the intestines. That'll divert blood away from skeletal muscle because now you're not in a fight or flight situation and you want to rest and digest. So it's going to bring the blood flow back to the intestines to increase your ability to digest food. If we look at the heart, both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems innervate the heart. And we look at the heart output, kind of how much blood the heart is pumping out over any particular unit of time, heart output of blood. When the sympathetic nervous system is activated, the heart output increases. The heart pumps harder and pumps faster and pushes more blood out so that things like skeletal muscle can get more blood flow. In addition to diverting blood flow from the intestines to skeletal muscle, the heart's just going to push more out so there's more available for the skeletal muscle. When the parasympathetic nervous system is activated, the heart output goes down. The heart is pumping less hard and it's beating less often. It's just working less because you don't need as much blood flow to the muscles for movement. So you go to kind of a baseline level that's sufficient for activities that involve resting and digesting. So these examples of blood flow involve the activity of smooth muscle because smooth muscle is around our blood vessels and 
determines where the blood is going to flow to, and cardiac muscle, because the cardiac muscle makes up the heart. And then if we think about gland cells, there's a bunch of different glands that the autonomic nervous system controls, and they tend to be activated kind of differently at different times. So one type of gland that's activated during fight or flight situations when the sympathetic nervous system is active are sweat glands out here in the skin. And the sweat glands are activated to secrete sweat, which helps cool us down, which increases our ability to move faster and farther if we're able to stay cool. Whereas some glands that are activated by the parasympathetic nervous system include things like the salivary glands that produce saliva in our mouth because saliva is very useful for digestion. And it's part of a number of activities that happen that help us digest food. So I find these phrases helpful when I'm thinking about what effects the autonomic nervous system will have on different tissues of the body during different situations. Because like in all of these examples, most of the things that the sympathetic nervous system does when it's activated increase the body's ability to turn stored energy into movement to deal with dangerous situations like moving blood from the intestines to skeletal muscle and increasing the amount of blood being pumped around from the heart and increasing sweat production from sweat glands to keep us cool while we're moving to deal with a dangerous situation. Whereas all of these things that the parasympathetic nervous system is doing make sense in non-threatening situations where we're actually trying to conserve and store energy, like diverting blood flow away from skeletal muscle to the intestines to increase digestion decreasing heart cardiac output to conserve energy, and increasing saliva production from the salivary glands to help with digestion as well. But the autonomic nervous system affects many more structures and has many more functions than I can cover in this little introductory video. For instance, autonomic neurons play a role in changing the size of your pupils in your eyes, in sexual responses, and in secretion from a whole bunch of other glands. And because it so, does so many different things, I find it best to actually not cover it all in one sitting, but instead to cover these things as you're studying each individual organ system. Because almost any organ system you're going to cover is going to have autonomic neurons coming in and affecting how that organ system functions. So one of the things we need to appreciate when we deal with um, the autonomic nervous system is the effect of certain drugs on its function. Sympathomimetic uh, medications are going to mimic the action of the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. So you're going to see an increase in the heart rate, an increase in the, uh, the force of uh, contraction of the heart, and an increase in blood pressure, okay? While parasympho, uh mimetics are going to perform the opposite, right? They're going to decrease the heart rate, the blood pressure, uh, increase digestive activity, uh, diuresis, okay, and um, they're also going to uh, lower blood sugar levels, okay. Um, vasomimetics are designed to control um, the degree of vasoconstriction in the, um, in the blood vessels, okay. If we're talking about a, a sympathetic vasomimetic, uh, we would see um, Constrict, vasoconstriction of blood vessels that supply the digestive, urinary, and reproductive system, whereas um, if we're talking about a parasympathetic vasomimetic, we would see um, constriction, well, we would see dilation of blood vessels that supply digestive, urinary, and reproductive, okay, and a constriction of blood vessels that supply heart, lungs, and skeletal muscle, okay. Vagolytics are drugs that mimic the action of the vagus nerve, which is the major parasympathetic lead to the um, thoracic and um, abdominal pelvic organs, all right? Um, and that's cranial nerve 10, okay? Um, so, um, essentially, vagolytic and parasympathomimetic is the same, okay? Sympathetics and parasympathetics continuously fire at a low level um, all the time, but in emergency situations, the sympathetic firing rate goes up and the, uh, the parasympathetic rate remains in the background, whereas um, in non-emergency situations, 
we have um, the uh, the reverse, right? The sympathetics uh, fire at a reduced rate, and the parasympathetics predominate. Okay, but there are some examples of exclusive targets of the uh, sympathetic nervous system, the uh, sweat glands and the smooth muscle and the blood vessels are exclusive sympathetic targets and um, exclusive parasympathetic targets include the blood vessels um, that supply the, the clitoris and the penis okay um, and the um, um, the parasympathetics um, that maintain um, um, what we call parasympathetic tone, okay? Um, sympathetic tone is essentially a function of um, the, um, the background firing of the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system and that helps maintain blood pressure, okay? And that's because that smooth muscle is um, an exclusive target of the sympathetic division. Okay. When we talk about the um, the autonomic nervous system, we have to appreciate the fact that this is a, a system that's made up of nerve fibers that are a bit slower than the somatic motor division or the somatosensory division. Um, these tend to be lightly or even in some cases unmyelinated fibers so their speeds are much slower. There's a preganglionic and a postganglionic fiber. The preganglionic fiber generally uses the neurotransmitter acetylcholine to communicate with the postganglionic fiber in both the parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions. And then in the sympathetic division, the postganglionic fiber uses norepinephrine or epinephrine, so it's called adrenergic. And the uh, postganglionics in the parasympathetic division generally use acetylcholine, okay? Um, so again, uh, the fact that we use a different neurotransmitter means that there's going to be a different effect on the target, okay? Remember that the postganglionic runs from the preganglionic to the effector, and the preganglionic runs from the central nervous system to the postganglionic. Now remember also that in the um, sympathetic autonomic nervous system, the preganglionics emerge from the thoracic and lumbar spine coming out of the lateral horns, whereas in the parasympathetic division, we're emerging from the brainstem and the sacral spinal cord. Right? So you can see um, some of the ways that we do naming conventions here. Um, in the sympathetic division, we've already discussed the fact that the, the preganglionics are short and the postganglionics are long, and that's flipped in the parasympathetic division. Um, this is one of the reasons that we nicknamed the sympathetic division the thoracolumbar division. Um, the firing of a single sympathetic neuron provides a generalized widespread response with a lot of organs that respond to this. It's also um, aided by the secretion of the adrenal gland which spills epinephrine directly into the bloodstream. And so we've I kind of already talked about those effects, right? We have vasoconstriction of blood supply to urinary, digestive, and reproductive. We have vasodilation of blood supply to heart and lungs and skeletal muscle. We have bronchodilation and we have um, increased sweat production and decreased urine production and decreased peristalsis. Uh, we also see an increase in blood pressure, blood sugar, and blood oxygen level as well as heart rate. In the parasympathetic division, we have um, uh, the preganglionic neurons that come out from the brainstem and the sacrum. This is one of the reasons that we call it the craniosacral division. The parasympathetic ganglia are very close to their target, so the postganglionics have a short trip to their target, and generally acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter in both cases. Okay? Um, and remember, the effects are usually opposite that of the sympathetic division. 
and also keep in mind that when we talk about targets that are not dual innervated, meaning that they aren't served by both autonomic divisions, the way that we increase or decrease the effect of an autonomic division is not by calling the other division in because it's absent. We simply decrease the rate of firing from the division that is the exclusive target for that particular tissue. Okay. So as an example, right, if we wanted to um, promote vasodilation, we would decrease sympathetic firing to the smooth muscle in the walls of the blood vessels, right, because there would be no parasympathetic component. Okay. Now the cranial nerves um, have, have some parasympathetic fibers in them, okay, oculomotor, and facial, glossopharyngeal, and vagus are all major um, parasympathetic leads, right? The oculomotor nerve innervates the extrinsic eye muscles, and that those are somatic motor fibers, but they also carry parasympathetic, parasympathetic fibers that talk to the muscles that control the, the diameter of the pupil, as well as muscles that control the shape of the lens. So those are parasympathetics. The facial nerve carries parasympathetic fibers to tear glands and salivary glands and nasal glands, and the glossopharyngeal carries parasympathetics to salivary glands as well, while the vagus nerve is the major parasympathetic lead to the organs in the chest and the abdominal pelvic cavity. Okay. The neurotransmitters that are used in the autonomic nervous system acetylcholine for all preganglionics regardless of the division and in the sympathetic division norepinephrine for the postganglionic and in the uh, postganglionics and the parasympathetic it's acetylcholine again okay um, the um, parasympathetic discharge is going to um, decrease heart rate because of the effects of acetylcholine well, sympathetic discharge will increase the heart rate because of the production of epinephrine. So those are examples of how um, different, different neurotransmitters have a variety of effects. Okay. How do we terminate activity? Well, acetylcholine is made by cholinergic fibers and it diffuses to its receptor and then is degraded by acetylcholinesterase, while norepinephrine is secreted by adrenergic fibers and it relies on diffusion in order to um, to have its effects reduced okay so um, again remember that in sympathetic stimulation we have um, epinephrine in both the bloodstream and in the um, postganglionic neurons and that's going to have broader and longer lasting effects because it takes longer to clear the epinephrine from the bloodstream. And that's one of the reasons why when you panic you don't immediately calm down. Okay. Um, the autonomic nervous system receptors can be grouped into cholinergics which are muscarinic and nicotinic and adrenergics which are alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2. Okay. Um, muscarinic and nicotinic receptors get their name from the substances that they were initially found to bind to. Nicotinic receptors were discovered because they bound nicotine. Muscarinic receptors bind, bound muscarine, okay, which is a, a plant product. The adrenergic receptors bind adrenaline. Okay. Um, norepinephrine binds to both alpha and beta receptors, while acetylcholine binds cholinergic uh, receptors called muscarinic and nicotinic due to dual innervation. Most effector organs have receptors for both norepinephrine and acetylcholine and this lets the autonomic nervous system speed up or slow down the effector because you're using again a different signal. Okay. So you can see here the different neurotransmitters that are used. Okay. Um, note that muscarinic receptors are critical because they're located on the target organs of the parasympathetic nervous system and that activates them when the parasympathetic postganglionics discharge. Note that the vagal 
the vagus nerve travels with parasympathetic system um, and its discharge is called vagal discharge and it activates muscarinic receptors and slows the heart rate. Nicotinic receptors are located on the ganglia and will um, basically be stimulated when preganglionics discharge. Um, um, the uh, non-autonomic nicotinic receptors are not part of the autonomic nervous system. When the sympathetic autonomic nervous system fires, it releases norepinephrine, and that activates adrenergic receptors. These are called alpha and beta receptors and are located on the effector or the target organs. As an example, when the sympathetic system fires, norepinephrine activates beta-1 receptors, and that increases the heart rate and the contractile force. This results in a faster heart rate and a stronger contraction of the heart muscle. In your textbook, table 12-4 on page 225 talks about some of the different responses from adrenergic innervation. An agonist can be either naturally occurring or pharmacological. As an example, epinephrine activates beta 1 and 2 adrenergic receptors and increases the heart rate and the force of contraction as well as bronchodilation. A pharmacological agent such as epidrine mimics the action of epinephrine. The most common antagonists are pharmacological agents. For example, uh, propranolol blocks beta-1 and beta-2 adrenergics and slows the heart rate and force of contraction. Page 226 details some of these pharmacological uses for these compounds. Okay. All right. I thank you for joining me today. Uh, again, if you have any questions regarding um, this information, please get in contact with me um, by email. I should get back to you uh, within a day. And I thank you for listening.